So again, imagine something. Imagine that you do not have food. If you have no food, you starve. It may take a few weeks, but then you're dead. However, if you have no water, you're dead in a few days. Having access not just to clean, but to any water is an acute problem for more and more people on this planet. I checked on the Nestle website, and they insist that their former CEO, Peter Brabeck Lemath, never said that water is not a human right. And that is true according to the fact checker websites. He never said those exact words. Nestle makes enormous profits by buying water from public sources for extremely cheap, bottling it and selling it to you at the prices you all know. And there is and was a discussion if that is a justifiable use of public resources. And in the course of that discussion, he said the following. The one opinion, which I think is extreme, is represented by the NGOs who bang on declaring water a public right. That means, as a human being, you should have a right to water. That is an extreme solution. The other view says that water is a foodstuff like any other, and like any other foodstuff, it should have a market value. So what's the kingdom of God like? The kingdom of God is like a place where everything is a commodity and has market value. Or the kingdom of God is a place where everybody has water to drink and food to eat, and no one questions that in order to feed his greed. What is a kingdom you can imagine? Our times are changing fast. But how we imagine the world is still rooted in the 19th century as time that gave rise to the modern world, to its economics, its politics, and its worldview. After the French Revolution, the emerging capitalism freed us from the yoke of feudalism. Liberalism, the theories of non-interference by government into economic processes, make sense in a world where some people have the right to say the following. I am a lord. And because I am a lord, I take a huge chunk of your wealth to finance my being a lord. If you don't like it, complain to God who ordered the world that it is like it is. Imagine when you are an early industrialist, you rightfully want to get rid of those people. And one way of doing that is, you know, putting them on the guillotines like the French Revolution did, or relying on the free market to organize power and wealth. A market doesn't give a hoot whether you think you that God made you a lord and that you therefore are entitled to free lunch. The market, in theory, the market re rewards only the successful. A free market responds to the supply, uh, to the to the supply and demand of goods and services, and that's fine when it comes to luxury item that nobody really needs, but when it comes to the essentials of human life, the situation becomes much more problematic. People need food and water. If food and water are commodities that belong to Nestle or other companies, what happens when you're priced out of the market? For instance, a free labor market works like this. Wages rise if labor is in short supply. Rising wages attracts more labor until the market is saturated, and then the wages drop. And that's exactly early capitalist theory, how a free market works. However, the, the uh, reality of this self-regulation is that when the wages drop, people starve, because people usually have no alternative source of income, and they have to get food and water from somewhere, for instance, from Nestlé. After a while, surplus workers who can't buy from Nestlé die of starvation, which in turn creates another labor shortage with its raising wages, and then you can buy from Nestlé again. The market does not care about lords, but the market doesn't care about workers either. When you starve and your family dies, 
You usually do not take that with the appropriate fatalism because the market will, in the end, solve all problems. Rather, you grab your pitchfork and you try to stick it to the man. Most likely, will, police will shoot you in the process, but when you die anyway, what's the harm in trying a little revolution? And because most politicians know that, they regulate the market. They keep the wages as low as possible, but not so low that the workforce riots. Revolution is bad for business. In the age of empire in the 19th century, politicians controlled the greed of the industrialists, but only in the heart of the industrialized world. There were no revolutions in Germany or Britain or France or the USA. However, on the imperial periphery, that are the places that supply the economic centers with raw materials, you do not need to appease the poor. You can't shoot the workforce in Manchester, but you can shoot Indian peasants without disrupting the economy too much. And that, in turn, created the industrialized West in contrast to the not industrialized so-called third world. Being a worker in Manchester in the 19th century is no fun, but being a peasant in India is far worse. That is the world we have inherited. A world with a huge gap between the haves and the have-nots. It's a world that in the course of the 20th century gave rise to a prosperous middle class in the West. But for most of the century, it left the rest of the world exactly where it was in the 19th century, a world of poverty and starvation. And sometimes it seems we need a miracle to feed the world. How else could it be done? But then we check and notice that our industrialized agriculture is more than capable to feed the whole world. Problem is, the food is here and the hunger is far away, in the Sahel zone or in south-central Los Angeles. There is a plethora of technical solutions that get food and starving people together. Some are smart, some are dumb. Some work, some don't. But the problem we are talking about here is not a technical problem. The problem we are talking about goes much deeper. It is still one of those problems of human existence that Jesus addresses in his parables. What is the kingdom of God like? Maybe the kingdom of God is like a place where everybody says, we cannot feed all those people like the disciples do. Tell them to go away and take care of themselves. But Jesus says, no, it can be done. When the bounty of creation goes through the hands of God, a oh, miracle of miracles, suddenly there is enough for everybody. Even though all the available wisdom insists it can't be done. So I think the feeding of the 5,000 is not a story about divine forces intervening in history to show everybody how divine Jesus is. It's not a story about how right about religion those are who claim to be Jesus' disciples. Big production theater that proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is exactly who we say Jesus is. I think it's rather a story about the disciples. Jesus' disciples back in the day and us today, right here in Port Angeles. Disciples who say, it can't be done, while Jesus tells them, have faith. The Holy Spirit knows what she is doing. What we need is faith and vision, and then reality will conform to our faith and to our vision. This is a story about what we can imagine, about what we dare to imagine. Can we imagine a world where all are fed? Where all have the means to feed themselves? Or is our imagination still caught up in the convictions of the 19th century, where the world necessarily is divided between the haves and the have-nots? And that leads us, of course, to the fear that true justice will only make us poor and that scarcity and competition is the unchangeable reality of the world we live in. 
God's love might be abundant, but stuff is not. Scarcity is a fundamental driver of capitalism. The level of scarcity determines the price of a commodity. And capitalism's biggest critic, socialism, makes the same basic assumption that stuff is scarce. Both center on dividing stuff that is scarce. And the difference between them is only who gets what, but both cannot imagine anything else. There is no imagination about abandons, neither in capitalism nor in socialism. Both are only capable to organize scarcity. Believing in abundance is in its core a question of our imagination. God tells us that there is enough. Science tells us that there is enough. Dare we depart from the convictions of the 19th century? The Industrial Revolution is over. The challenges of the 21st century are fundamentally different. The question is, what kingdom of God can we imagine now? The most profound answers to the problems of justice and peace start in our hearts and in our minds. Jesus could imagine what the disciples could not. Jesus could imagine that there was enough for all, and he was right. Are we able to trust Jesus' imagination? If we can imagine it, it can be done. Amen.